All right. Um, welcome to this very topical and extremely relevant and timely conversation with our dear and very knowledgeable friend, Alex Trayman, Managing Director and Jerusalem Bureau Chief of JNS.org. As all of you no doubt are aware, on Sunday, the Knesset voted by a razor thin margin um, to remove Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu from office and a national unity government has been sworn in with Naftali Bennett of the right-leaning Yamina party beginning his rotation as Prime Minister immediately and Yair Lapid of the left-leaning left Yeshatid party acting as foreign minister but um, beginning his rotation in two years. Um, we're here to talk to Alex Trayman, who knows everything um, that there is to know um, about the machinations of the very convoluted um, Israeli political system. Uh, first of all, Alex, some background. How did we get to this point? Right. So it actually starts several years ago. Um, it was in the end of 2018 when uh, Vigdor Lieberman, who was the defense minister, uh, resigned from Netanyahu's right-wing government, uh, pushing Israel into new elections. Is the That government was getting toward the end of the term, and Netanyahu was considering uh, consolidating his power with new elections in any case. Um, they went to new elections. The right-wing uh, would have secured 65 or so seats with Lieberman enough to form a government, but Lieberman held out of joining a Netanyahu right-wing government. Um, and Netanyahu fell just a couple of mandates behind uh, the required majority and decided to trigger a second set of elections, figuring that if he went to elections again, that things would sort themselves out. Um, things did not sort themselves out. It's important to note that in the second election, and there was four consecutive elections here, in the second election, uh, Naftali Bennett uh, actually divorced himself from his traditional uh, nationalist right-wing voter base and created the new right party. He created basically this Yamina party um, and actually failed to get across the Knesset threshold. So just uh, in, in 2019, during the, the second election cycle, uh, the man who's now prime minister didn't even make it into the Knesset. Um, Netanyahu in the second election was also short, barely, of a majority. And um, after trying to gain defectors, uh, by the way, I just want to mention if Bennett had come across with his four seats and he was only 2000 votes short of having four full seats, which is the threshold. Netanyahu would have had a right wing government. Bennett would have joined that government and that would have been the end of the cycle. Um, Netanyahu went to a third election. Uh, the third election had Netanyahu one seat short of 60 um, with potentially two right wing defectors in the blue and white party ready to come in. Um, and then Israel really got into a, a terrible mess. I mean, we, I remember we had some webinars about this at the time that the, the opposition, which couldn't form a government, uh, wanted to pass legislation at the time uh, in the Knesset, form like an alternative coalition within the parliament without actually having coalition to pass legislation that would have invalidated Netanyahu, uh, both on the basis of term limits and then also on the basis of having a prime minister serving while under criminal indictment. Um, and they actually tried to make a parliamentary push and replace the Speaker of the Knesset, who was number two in the Likud, Yuli Edelstein. It went to the Supreme Court. It was a mess. Um, I don't want to get into the details of that now, but basically right at this point of massive legislative and judicial crisis, you also had the onset of coronavirus. And everybody understood at that moment, including Benny Gantz, who was the chief challenger to Netanyahu in these three elections, understood that uh, this was a serious moment. Nobody understood exactly how serious it was going to be. But, you know, we were starting to see what was happening in Italy and Spain and elsewhere. And we realized that it was time to put the politics on hold. And Gantz actually broke up his large blue and white party with Yair Lapid going into the opposition with his 17 seats of the party. 
while Gantz brought his 15 seats into a government together with Netanyahu, they recreate, created a rotation arrangement. Uh, and this is important, we'll talk about it in a second, where Gantz actually became the alternate prime minister. Uh, and Gantz was supposed to take over midway through the term. Um, now, Netanyahu never wanted Benny Gantz to become the prime minister. Um, Gantz knew that. Gantz had negotiated that if Netanyahu would crash the government for any reason, uh, that Gantz would automatically become the prime minister even prior to an election. However, there was one thing that Gantz didn't think about, which was the passing of a budget. Uh, and any government needs to pass a budget, you're supposed to pass it within 90 days. And if you can't pass a government uh, budget, that is basically a signal that you do not have a government and it's an automatic trigger for elections. Uh, so at first, Netanyahu and Gantz actually legislated to change the deadline for the passage of a budget. They pushed it off. And basically, this whole transitional government's gone without budgets for, for a few years. Uh, and when the final deadline came, Netanyahu triggered an election, uh, hoping that now after he had secured the Abraham Accords, after he had secured Israel you know, fairly well uh, during this coronavirus crisis, that he would then you know, gain those votes that he was lacking. Uh, it didn't work out exactly as he would have liked. Um, even with Naftali Bennett, if Bennett would have joined Netanyahu, the Likud and the religious camp, they would have had 59 seats, still just too short of a majority. Um, but it did not seem, it did not appear that there would be any defectors, those that had promised not to sit with Netanyahu, including those on the right, like Avigdor Lieberman, also Gidon Saar. Uh, important to note also that Gidon Saar uh, had tried to challenge Netanyahu for the Likud party leadership in the third election, prior to the third election. Netanyahu trounced Saar uh, 75 to 25% in that primary. Uh, but instead of bringing Saar back uh, and, and pulling him in close and giving him a ministry in a government that had 36 ministers, a pretty large government, he sent uh, Saar into the doghouse. And then prior to the fourth election, Saar took him and five other defectors out of the Likud party because they were so incensed that they had no future in the party and they created the new hope party. And they also ran on the promise not to sit with Netanyahu. Uh, so this time around, you basically had Lieberman, Saar promising not to sit with Netanyahu and Bennett sort of hedging his bet the entire way saying, if Netanyahu can form a government on the right, I will enter right-wing government. But if not, then we'll have to see what happens. Now, as we got closer to the election, um, Bennett wanted to shore up his right-wing voter base. And he basically came on television multiple times and said, I will not sit with the left. I will not sit with merits. I will not sit with labor. I will not sit with Arabs. I will not sit with Lapid because Lapid is left and I am right. Uh, that's what he said. And he actually went on to evening news program with a printed piece of paper that he signed that he held up to the screen like this and said for the entire nation to see i will not sit with yair lapid not even in any sort of a rotation arrangement uh and this is the promise that he took into the election he got his seven seats uh and then it was very clear that he had been negotiating with lapid the entire time and um when Netanyahu could not form a government, the mandate passed to Lapid, who had 17 seats. That was the second largest party behind the 30 seats that Likud had, the largest party by far. Uh, but Netanyahu failed to form a government. The mandate went to Lapid. And in order to get Bennett you know, away from the right wing camp, he had to offer Bennett the greatest possible prize, which was the prime minister's chair itself. Uh, Bennett took it uh, and now is sitting in the chair of the man that most <laughs> most parliamentarians wanted to see removed. Uh, and for the first time in 12 years, you have a new prime minister of Israel. That's Naftali Bennett. Um, the government passed uh, without a majority. It actually passed with the slimmest of margins, 60 to 59. They actually had to bring in um, one of the MKs from uh, labor. I mean, just 
uh, Emily Moati, okay, was in the hospital. She had received like a spinal tap for some kind of like strange infection. And they had to like bring her on a stretcher into the Knesset. She couldn't even sit up or stand. And they had to bring her in to pass, to get the final vote, to pass the government 60 to 59, um, you know, to, to get Netanyahu out. Um, now, it is important to note that Lapid used the same formula that Benjamin Netanyahu created with Benny Gantz, which was a rotation arrangement with an alternate prime minister. So while Bennett's the prime minister for now, Lapid is the alternate prime minister. Lapid, as alternate prime minister, has a veto over all legislation that comes up through the coalition. Uh, and as you mentioned, Sarah, in the beginning, that uh, Lapid will become the prime minister in August of 2023 if this government uh, lasts that long. Um, now, people ask, what is the makeup of this government? People say that it is a unity government. Uh, to the extent that it has left-wing and right-wing parties in it, uh, that is a, does sort of constitute a, a unity alignment. Uh, it's not a traditional unity alignment. Traditional unity alignments have been between the two largest parties when neither the large party on the right or the large party on the left was able to form a right wing or a left wing government. The two largest parties themselves would come together to form a unity center government. So this government excludes what is by far the largest party in the electorate, which is the ruling Likud party. Um, this government has every single member of Israel's left wing, okay? This is as far left a government as you could possibly create. If you would draw it up and say, how, how left of a government could we have? It's this government, okay? Uh, there are 38 center left uh, members uh, in this government. In addition, this government relied on, for the first time in Israeli history, the backing of an Israeli party, uh, sorry, an Israeli Arab party, the Ram party. The Ram Party in its charter is a member of the southern branch of the Islamic movement. It is literally a sister party of Hamas. Uh, and so you have the entire left wing of the spectrum plus an Arab party in the government. And then that's backed by 20 members of the right. And when you look at those 20 members of the right, which are led by Lieberman and his Israel Beitenu party, which is a mostly Russian immigrant party, Gidon Saar, a party of Likud rebels, plus uh, Bennett and Ayel Shaked's Yamina party. Um, those three leaders, those, those leaders, Bennett, Saar, and Lieberman, all decided that sitting with the entire left of the spectrum, plus the Arabs, was better than sitting with Benjamin Netanyahu. Okay, and, that's, uh, and that is basically why Netanyahu is now out of office. Um, now, there was a major campaign to get Netanyahu out of office, a multifaceted campaign over many years. First of all, the media has hated Netanyahu for decades, and they, they've just been worse and worse and worse in terms of hitting Netanyahu. Uh, you know, he, he was their target for many years, and that over time, wore down some of the public support, but also wore down the support of his allies uh, in the parliament. Um, but then also Netanyahu violated a lot of promises that he made to various um, allies in the parliament over the years, and that came back to bite him. Uh, and you know, so many of his own party members and obviously the rebels and, and Lieberman and others were incensed by... <laughs> by Netanyahu and they, they didn't want to work with him anymore. And so he, he essentially lost the parliament. I mean, and that, that's, that's really what happened that you, at this, you also had the criminal investigations, which, you know, it, I think we've also talked in depth over time about the criminal investigations that really wouldn't hold weight if they were, if they were in the United States or other democratic countries, the charges wouldn't stand. Uh, in fact, the prosecution called over 300 witnesses in what they consider the most serious of the cases. And when you understand that they called 300 witnesses, that means that the prosecution themselves hoped to drag out the process of this trial for as long as possible. Even if they would get an innocent verdict at the end, you know, or the, case, the, the charge would be thrown out, 300 witnesses, how long will it take to interrogate that? So that 
that means that over time you can just wear down the public by constantly calling Netanyahu corrupt, constantly say that he's been charged with bribery, even though the definition of bribery in Israel and the definition of bribery in America is not the same thing, Yeah, um, which I, I'm not going to get into too much. But when you put all those things together, it was basically too much and uh, Netanyahu was out. So what does that mean? Okay, now we have a new government for the first time. It's it's an untested government. It's a government that does not, that is only unified by one issue. And that government has already accomplished that one issue. The one issue was to get Netanyahu out. And they've done that. So the question is now, what is the glue that unites this government together? Um, well, the glue continues to remain Netanyahu because Netanyahu, instead of resigning, uh, went into the opposition and has already promised multiple times to torpedo this government and to take it down. So that same glue that brought these people together is likely to actually hold them together. Um, and for people like Bennett, who's now the prime minister of Israel, he has no place to go. Okay. He's got absolutely no place to go because as we saw in the second election, he didn't pass the threshold right now, the left wing of Israel is not going to like having a right wing prime minister. They don't like Bennett to be their prime minister. They just they just understood that they needed him if they wanted to unseat Netanyahu. Now, the right wing of Israel hates Bennett because Bennett is the one that took his seats over to the left to make a government with them. So he's lost popularity. He doesn't he never had popularity on the left. Now he's lost all his popularity on the right. Even one of the members of his own party voted against this government because uh, Bennett broke his promises. A num another two members of the party who could have entered the Knesset next uh, if ministers would resign uh, their posts under the Norwegian law, they also resigned the party because they are so upset about what Bennett had has done and broken his promises to the people. So he's got no place to go. He's got to stay there and make it work. And he's hoping that people will see over this next two years that he's a capable leader. Um, and what does that mean to be a capable leader? Well, you can be fairly certain that the malign elements in this Middle East, which is a dangerous region, are going to be testing Israel's government. We saw even they tested Netanyahu as a transitional prime minister with the shooting of over 4,000 rockets just a few weeks ago. Uh, and you could be certain that there will be tests again where the enemies of the Jewish people will test the metal of this government to see how strong it is and also whether it can withstand uh, international pressure. Right? Everybody knows that Netanyahu was famous for standing up to international pressure. Uh, Yair Lapid, who's the alternate prime minister and now the foreign minister, uh, is going to take on a foreign ministry role like we haven't seen in Israel for many years because Netanyahu himself uh, actually acted for the most part over the last many years as the foreign minister. Uh, it, the relationship with the United States was also handled by his senior advisor, Ron Dermer, who was the ambassador to the United States. Um, so now the left, the left wing champion, Yair Lapid, takes over that relationship with Antony Blinken and the United States. And you could be certain, as we already saw last month when Blinken was here, that the United States seeks to completely reverse everything that the Trump administration did for Israel, including the isolation of the Palestinian Authority. The, this administration is going to continue is going to renew funding to the Palestinian Authority. This administration already wants to reopen up a special diplomatic mission or a consulate for the Palestinian Authority and to do that in Jerusalem, which people argue is a violation of the Jerusalem Embassy Act. Um, also, this administration is likely going to try to press uh, Israel to enact settlement freezes uh, over the Green Line. And most importantly, the U.S. government is going to turn around and say that Benjamin, it was Benjamin Netanyahu's fault that Israel is no longer a bipartisan concern in the United States. And why is that? Because Netanyahu came and disrespected a Democratic president of the United States by addressing a joint session of Congress to oppose the Iran nuclear deal. And the United States is going to turn around to Bennett and Lapid and say Netanyahu made a huge mistake. Not only did he did he alienate Israel from all the Democrats that used to like Israel, but he didn't even block the, the, the signing of the JCPOA, that Obama signed the JCPOA, JCPOA even despite Netanyahu's objections. So now we're, 
the administration is going to press Israel to keep its disagreements to itself, okay, not to not to uh, oppose it in any way, and you can be sure that they're going to march back into it. Now, it is important to note that Netanyahu's opposition to the JCPOA actually was one of the most important puzzle pieces in the formation of the Abraham Accords, because the other nations of the region saw that if the United States wouldn't protect them, and Israel, which is an emerging military power, would actually stand up to that pressure and would speak out against the president of the United States on the one hand, and then two, act both in Syria and covertly inside Iran to, to remove the nuclear capabilities that, that you wanted to be aligned with Israel. And that's why you actually have the Abraham Accords. And this new administration, even though they say that they want to continue with the Abraham Accords, what they're going to try to do is they are going to try to link up further normalization agreements uh, in exchange for Israeli concessions to the Palestinians. I, I mean, there was a, an op-ed in the, in the Los Angeles Times just a few weeks ago by Dennis Ross, where he said that the, this administration should push Saudi Arabia to normalize relations with Israel in exchange for an Israeli settlement freeze uh, beyond the security barrier. So this is uh, the situation now, and we're going to have to see a few things. Number one, if this Israeli government has the metal to stand up to the physical security challenges, if it has the metal to deal with the diplomatic onslaught that it's been facing, uh, and if it itself, by itself can stay together despite not having any ideological grounds on which to stand. Um, so that's the situation that we're in. And uh, I'll be happy to open it up to any questions. Great. Okay. As the moderator, I'm going to take the liberty of um, asking you the first question. I'm particularly concerned um, about the remarks that were made in Arabic um, by Ram Party Chair, um, which, as you said, is part of the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist Party. Um, um, Mansour Abbas, um, before he spoke in Hebrew, and these have been translated in the press as, quote, we will reclaim the lands that were expropriated from our people. This is our national cause of the first degree. Then he switched to Hebrew and spoke in more conciliatory terms. Um, what exactly is Mr. Abbas's position within the next government? And um, how dependent is this coalition on uh, Mansour Abbas and if, um, Naftali Bennett decides that he has got to act in the national security interests of Israel. Um, can uh, Mansour Abbas just flee and then the coalition will fall apart? No, oh, that's right. I mean, so first of all, we've, we've always known that what Arabic leaders say in Arabic is more telling than what they say in English or in this case in Hebrew. Um, and uh, right now, the Ram party is more or less taking the similar approach to Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is to engage politically. Not only is Ram an, a member of the government, they are a kingmaker in this government. If they will re remove their support for the government, the government will fall. Uh, and you know they could very well they, so that's a tremendous power. That, that they have. And, uh, you know, for a sister party of Hamas now to say that they're holding the balance in the Israeli government. I mean, that's a significant position that they have. And it's a, uh, it's just one of the many factors that Bennett and Lapid are going to have to balance. Awful. Um, okay. Um, we have with us um, um, our wonderful director of our program for Israel's national security, Benjamin Whale. Benjamin, would you like to ask some questions of your own or read some of the questions that might have come in? Sure thing. And uh, thank you very much, Alex, for joining us today for this uh, very interesting and timely uh, webinar. Uh, the first question that came in is, uh, how has Israel's new formed relationship with the Arab countries and new government impacted the future of Israel's Palestinian relationship? Well, you know, I, I think that that depends very much on the United States. I mean, what we saw was that the Trump administration basically incentivized peace with the Arab nations by bringing them all kinds of financial incentives and like with the UAE also, you know, promising to deliver F-35s and the like. Um, and 
they also shut off the supply of money to the malign actors like Iran and to the Palestinian Authority. Okay, when you when you push the the money from the West towards peace, you see all of a sudden you have four normalization agreements and a fifth one with uh, Kosovo. So you have normalization. But when you turn the spigot the other way, when you take away the financial incentives for peace, for peace. And, and you replace, replace that, that instead yeah. with, uh, you know, with funding for Iran, renewed funding for Iran, with renewed funding for the Palestinian Authority. And you tell Hamas, listen, whatever Israel, whatever damage Israel does down there, we're going to make sure you get international aid to rebuild. So you're also promising money to them basically to attack Israel. Then you're going to see you're going to see the reverse. So I, I think it's it's pretty simple that as long as you're incentivizing malign actors to be malign, that that's what you're going to get. And we've been talking about uh, Bennett as prime minister and the new government, but not much is being said about Netanyahu as the head of opposition. Number one, how's that transition going to be for him after 12 years right now being prime minister? Number two, what kind of head of opposition other than attacking the coalition what kind of opposition will Netanyahu lead? Right, it's a good question. So first of all, in terms of a transition, the traditional meeting between an outgoing prime minister and an incoming prime minister, uh, which is usually a ceremonious transition, barely took place yesterday. There was a 25 minute meeting. It's reported that Netanyahu only spoke about the Iranian issue. He was standing during the meeting. He didn't even sit down and he denied Bennett a photo opportunity at the end, which is traditional, and then immediately ran over to the Knesset for a meeting of the 52 member opposition, uh, vowing to torpedo the government and said that he has his fingers on the pulse of this government and that he will figure out what its weak points are and that he he vows to uh, to take it down and to come back into office. Um, will how long this opposition, this new opposition will stay united under Netanyahu, that remains to be seen. I, you know, there, <laughs> there's a many senior members of the Likud party that recognize that Netanyahu has made certain mistakes in their view. Netanyahu, for example, could have stepped down and allowed a new member of the Likud to form a strong right-wing government of 72 members that would have been led by the Likud. Uh, you know, so the balance of power could have stayed both with the Likud and the right wing. Netanyahu opted not to do that. There was also a very interesting golden parachute opportunity for Netanyahu. It was a once in seven year opportunity, which was a vacancy for the president of Israel. And the, the president of Israel gets voted in only by a uh, Knesset majority. So if Netanyahu would have said, I am stepping down. And I am allowing another member of the Likud to take the reins. It's very likely that Gidon Saar, who was a longtime member of the Likud, would have come back uh, you know, to join the right wing. Uh, they would have been able to form a right wing government. And that coalition could have put Netanyahu in the office of the presidency, where he could have sat for seven years. Uh, he would not have had to work with the parliament. He, he would have had some degree of immunity uh, with regard to needing to resign or whatever it is due to the corruption trials. Um, and in that role, he could have met foreign leaders. He could have addressed a joint session of Congress. He could have called a prime minister and a defense minister to his house for urgent consultations if there was a conflict. There was many things that Netanyahu, especially somebody as talented as Netanyahu, could accomplish with the seat of the presidency, which would have transformed the presidency into something different than what it has been under Ruvain Rivlin. But for whatever reasons, he calculated that he didn't want to do that and that he thought that this government, which is uh, what, he, what Netanyahu calls standing on the head of a needle, uh, could be collapsed and that he's hoping that at some point that the, the people will recognize that they need Netanyahu to get through the challenges and to, to put him back into office. Uh, at the same time, as I, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, the glue that held that, that enabled this uh, coalition, hodgepodge coalition to come together was the opposition to Netanyahu. And if Netanyahu is still presenting that opposition, that all could potentially also create the glue that keeps this coalition together uh, for a longer period. So that, that all remains to be seen. Thank you. And then uh, following up on the question about Benjamin Netanyahu, 
He's 71 years old now. The only prime minister who assumed office at an older age is Ariel Sharon at the age of 73 uh, and nine days. Is Netanyahu, in your opinion, uh, planning on running again or controlling uh, the scene from, from uh, the backstage? What, what's his uh, political future? Right. So when Ariel Sharon became the prime minister the last time, uh, he was in very poor health. Uh, the, the Secret Service of Israel used to have to count the number of steps that Sharon would, be, would take at any, at any um, event where he would have to go. And he was limited. They would limit him to 80 steps. Like he wasn't able to walk more than 80 steps. Netanyahu is a force of nature. Okay. Like I have, I, I've spoken to Netanyahu's uh, one, one of his senior advisors who's about my age, around the age of 40. He says he cannot keep up with Netanyahu. Netanyahu wakes up at seven in the morning. He said he, he eats for two minutes during meetings and it goes meeting to meeting to meeting until they force him to go to bed at like one 30 or two in the morning. Okay. The guy just is a nonstop workaholic for the state of Israel. Um, you know, I think he's got more energy than than most of us on the call. Um, and he doesn't think that he's done. He he believes that he has been, as he said, fraudulently removed from office, that this is a, a coup, you know, that in his opinion, what's happened. And I think that he very much does intend to return to office, whether he gets that opportunity, you know, it will depend on him good fortune and making a lot of good moves. And what I would say is that in this last period, they've attacked him so hard and there's been a number of mistakes. So perhaps he will catch his breath and uh, reorganize and start to think strategically. And I'm, I'm certain that he believes right now that he's going to be the prime minister of Israel again, whether or not that happens, we'll see. Thank you. And uh, what will uh, prime minister Bennett uh, do or how will he act when it comes to foreign policy in regards to the West Bank or other Arab populations in the Negev? Right. So because this government is, is held together by the Ram Party and also Israel's left, uh, you can imagine that uh, Bennett is not really going to be able to advance a right-wing agenda with regard to Judea and Samaria. Um, you know, he, he, this is not, you have a right wing prime minister that doesn't have any backing. This is a left wing government, uh, that is joined by enabled by right wing parties. Um, so I, I would imagine that, um, for both sides, I mean, the, the, both Lapid and Bennett, what they're going to try to do is to avoid crises, especially domestic crises. So I think what you're going to probably see, uh, status quo, uh, when it comes to Judea and Samaria issues, unless, of course, the United States applies a significant amount of pressure and also gives, potentially gives Israel a reason, like a, like a very big reason why it might take, it might take uh, actions that would seemingly be against the right-wing interests in Judea and Samaria, such as like a normalization agreement with Saudi Arabia. Thank you. And, and what was the role of the Biden administration informing the new government because of the leftists in this coalition, could Israel give more concessions to the Palestinians to satisfy the Biden administration? Right. So I think that, that the Biden administration does recognize that this is a tenuous situation and that Netanyahu is actually sitting and waiting on the side. So I think that they're going to try to be careful not to press Israel too hard at the moment, uh, because that will that will put Bennett into a spot where he has to choose and he could take down the government if that was the case. But if you look at how the United States operates and if you look at also how the Trump administration operates, there's a lot that the United States can do to further the ball with the Palestinians. So I think what, what you're going to see is that the United States actually take a number of steps to empower and embolden Palestinians and also to make clear that they do want to push closer toward a two-state solution and maybe toward a peace conference, but also to recognize that the, that the conditions for that are not, are not present now. So what they'll try to do is to change those conditions a little bit, loosen them up, uh, give more th to the Palestinians in terms of funding and, and other, and, you know, whatever else they can give. And then know that Yair Lapid is the going to be the prime minister in two years from now. So 
I, I would call it laying the groundwork for, for a reversal of course later. And speaking of Yair Lapid becoming prime minister in two years, do you think that uh, Prime Minister Bennett will take a page out of former Prime Minister Netanyahu's book and try to sabotage that rotation? Or do you think, uh, or do you estimate that he will uh, respect the full agreement? Well, I think that depends on, you know, how the public perceives uh, that he's doing his job. You know, right now it's too early to say, but if, if, if Bennett, perceives that if he would go to an election, that he would then be the champion of the right, especially if Netanyahu would no longer be in the picture. And if Bennett thought that he could gain himself 20 seats or more or 30 seats in an election, then sure. I mean, just look at how Bennett played Netanyahu. I mean, Bennett played Netanyahu. That's what it is. He, he lied to the entire public and doing something and to do something that he promised everybody he wouldn't do. And in a way, he, he took a page out of the Netanyahu's book. It's a big problem for Bennett. He, he has virtually zero credibility with the public right now. When he opens his mouth, you're not going to necessarily believe what he has to say because he, he just repeatedly over and over again said he would not do exactly the things that we now see that he planned to do the whole time. So he's got to overcome that gap. If he does overcome that gap and people say, wow, you know, Bennett is, uh, he's solid, you know, then you could see Bennett play that same trick and try to get to an election. But if it, like I said, Bennett doesn't right now, he's nowhere to go. So he's going to sit in that seat, glued to that seat as long as he can. And speaking of that credibility, um, a day or two after the formation of the new government, there was a poll that came out. Uh, which uh, basically showed that if elections occurred two days after the forming of the government, uh, both the BB and the anti-BB camps would remain the same. How do you explain that, uh, considering the fact that Saar and Bennett, uh, uh, quote unquote, betrayed some of their right wing uh, voters by joining an Arab party, by joining the left wing parties, uh, you would have expected them to shift to the other right wing parties, which all happen to fall uh, in the pro BB camp? Well, I would say that SARS voters um, knew what they were getting into when they voted for SAR. SAR basically ran a campaign. Uh, he actually wanted to be the head of the of this anti BB camp. When he first when he first uh, announced the formation of a new party, his party was polling over 20 seats. Uh, but then, and, and the media actually was putting a lot of energy behind him and giving him a lot of airtime. But the more airtime that Sar actually received, the the lower he started to do in the polls because people lost confidence in him, and he he barely made it across with six seats in the election. But so those six voters, those six the the voters behind those six seats, I think that they were satisfied with what Sar did. That's what they expected him to do. Um, I would say that the polls right now, it's it's pretty meaningless. Um, you know, we have to see what happens. It's, it, this, this is a, a major traumatic event in Israel, you know, and it's, it's been traumatic for, for several years already. We went through four consecutive elections. Uh, you know, Netanyahu is not bowing out gracefully by any means, you know, he, he's, he's riling up the, the whole country. So, you know, we'll have to see what the polls look like and maybe in a year from now. And uh, will this government be able to take military action against the Iran nuclear program? Should it become necessary? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the big issues is will this military, I mean, will the military take actions in Syria like it's been taking uh, over the past several years? Will this government uh, take part in covert actions like it has famously done uh, under Netanyahu and under uh, Yossi Cohen's leadership at the Mossad. Uh, Yossi Cohen just also uh, his uh, transitioned out of the, as head of the Mossad, he was replaced by the number two, David Barnea. Um, you would imagine that the United States is telling Israel to cut it out and not to continue to do co covert actions inside of, inside of Iran. Uh, at the moment and to give diplomacy a chance and to see what comes out of the agreement, uh, if anything. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big question mark. But one thing I will say is that the, the, I think that there's, three, there's three real reasons why the people of Israel are not super concerned about this government. Um, and 
the, the first is that Israelis believe in themselves and who they are as a people, who they are as a state, their purpose for being here. Israelis really believe in that. Um, so they're confident that the Jewish state, which has had many political hiccups and taken many horrific moves, you know, over the years, you know, always seems to rebound and continues to move forward and get stronger over time. Uh, two, the Israelis don't necessarily see the political class as being an appropriate representation of who they are as a people. Those are the politicians, and they, they've got their own considerations and games, and sometimes they work in our interest, sometimes they don't, but they're the politicians and we're the people. The third is that Israelis do have a tremendous uh, faith in the military, and that regardless of who is the prime minister, you know, the generals of the military are still the generals of the military. Uh, in fact, you know, Netanyahu's defense minister in the last government, Benny Gantz, is still the defense minister. And so he was working with Netanyahu in this last campaign. The chief of staff was yesterday is still the chief of staff today. So in terms of the the preparedness of the IDF and its its abilities, uh, I think the Israeli people still have a lot of confidence that if push comes to shove, that the IDF will do what's necessary. And I will add that, especially in Israel, when it comes to national security concerns and existential threats, the defense establishment tends to operate way above politics, where even during the last four elections, uh, military campaigns and uh, espionage and cyber campaigns still continued to, uh, to operate very smoothly, despite the lack of uh, any political stability in, in the country. So there are mechanisms put in place that are very well oiled and established and, and strong. Um, why do you think Netanyahu didn't take advantage of the presidency opportunity? Was he sure he'd stay prime minister despite the turmoil or wasn't certain he would win the presidency? and didn't want that embarrassment? Or were there any other factors in play in your opinion? Yeah, I think that those are good considerations. The The vote for presidency is a closed vote. I mean, it's a secret vote. It means you don't know ultimately who voted for what. So even if you have promises uh, that you would have those votes caucused, when push comes to shove, you, there's no way to know who voted for and who voted against. Uh, that's definitely a possibility. Uh, two, I think that Netanyahu feels that it's his duty to prevent uh, Iran from crossing the nuclear threshold and believes that Israel may be uh, in a military conflict with Iran at some point and believes that it's his destiny to lead Israel through that through that challenge. And he thinks that ultimately the majority of Israelis want him to be the prime minister and not anybody else. And all the polls even continue to show that the people prefer Netanyahu by a large margin as compared to any other candidate. So uh, when he looks at this coalition, this alignment, he sees that it's very flimsy and he wants to be back. And so if he thinks that he will be back in a, in a year or in two years, I mean, don't forget, this is a person that's made two political, major political comebacks before. He was prime minister from 96 to 99. It took him time to get back, but he did. And he thinks that, that this time around, he's even wiser and could get back even faster. And uh, how much power does Bennett have as Israeli prime minister? Can he act on anything without Lapid's okay? Right. So Lapid has a veto um, on any legislation, on any major diplomatic move. Remember also that Lapid is the foreign minister in addition to the alternate prime minister. I think one of the major power players in this government actually is the finance minister who is Avigdor Lieberman. Uh, you know, while Bennett and Lapid are going to be bickering back and forth and about, about the various issues, you, you're going to see Lieberman maybe a little bit more behind the scenes, perhaps, uh, but in, in a real position of power, especially with regard to these budgets. So he's sitting right where he wants to be. And he's one of the more clever, um, if not also one of the more corrupt members uh, have been accused of that anyways of uh, over the years. Um, and uh, I think he's actually one of the, the major power brokers of this government, too. And does uh, Victor Lieberman have any aspirations of becoming more than just a minister? Oh, I think so. I, I think that Lieberman actually in these uh, previous election cycles, you know, he was the one that that thought that, um, you know, if the right 
couldn't form a government and the left couldn't form a government that he might be able to skirt through the middle. It, he, he's the one that presented this idea, which was now carried out by Bennett. Um, so sure. Yeah. I think that he, he does has, have aspirations of being a prime minister one day, but he doesn't have that much public support. And uh, what is the effect of the new government on the ultra orthodox power and legislative support? Is there a chance that funds will be cut to the ultra orthodox and that more will be asked to serve in the idea? Oh, there's a great chance of that. In fact, uh, Lieberman, who's now the finance minister, this is been his major issue that he's been campaigning on over the successive successive electoral cycles. Uh, he definitely wants monies cut from the Haredi, the relig ultra-religious parties. Um, Lapid also, and even Bennett has talked about uh, bringing, bringing uh, more ultra-Orthodox into the army, also breaking the monopolies that the religious parties have over key issues like uh, kashrut, kosher certification, over conversions. Uh, you know, there's a a feeling among many secular Israelis that uh, the way the Orthodox parties have conducted themselves has been wildly inappropriate. And uh, now sitting in the opposition, they're going to have little opportunity uh, to prevent a government that wants change on these key issues from, from really taking it to the, you know, to these, to these parties. And then shifting to Hamas for a minute, uh, Hamas and I'm sure the Palestinian Authority both recognize that any policy in regards to Palestinians uh, could shake the government and even dissolve it. Uh, and, and you allude to that uh, earlier in this webinar. Is it Hamas's interest to kind of provoke some sort of escalation to tear apart the government? Or is it Hamas's interest to have this more pro-Arab approach in the government, but at the other hand, it would prevent Hamas from fulfilling its mission and carrying out various uh, assaults against Israelis. Well, Hamas now has its sister party uh, inside the government. And by having them go into the government for the first time, they were able to take out Israel's strong man, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, from the prime minister's office. That's like a tremendous victory. Uh, for Hamas, and um, you know, they their mission is to defeat the state of Israel. You know, so whatever they feel, you know, especially if the United States and the international community is not going to hold them accountable for launching rockets into Israel. In fact, they're just getting rewarded with with international funding for doing what they did. And if Israel is going to continue to get blamed diplomatically for for a counterattack inside Gaza, then sure, I don't see why Hamas had, wouldn't have the incentive to attack Israel again at, at some point, at some point soon. And, and you mentioned the connection between the Ra'am party and Hamas. Now that Ra'am is part of a government, uh, will that create more tension between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority and the Fatah? And also, uh, how will that affect uh, elections in the Palestinian Authority? Right. Uh, so the, the question with elections in the Palestinian Authority, um, you know, Mahmoud Abbas is now in, I think, year 17 of his four year term. Um, and one could look back at what happened. And, and I believe that the United States and the European Union both pressured uh, Abbas to hold elections. That was a move that destabilized the status quo with regard to rulership in Judea and Samaria. Um, Hamas wants to take over Judea and Samaria from Abbas. Abbas gets older and weaker, uh, and his public support among Palestinians continues to decline. Um, so at some point or another, there is going to be a leadership change uh, in Judea and Samaria, whether that's this year or in three years or five years from now, whenever that is. And we don't know who's going to emerge as the next power broker in Judea and Samaria. It very well could be Hamas. But what happens is when you have interests competing for the Palestinian street, so usually the rally cry is, well, which party is going to defend Jerusalem? Which party is going to defend the Al-Aqsa Mosque, right? Which party is going to be the most aggressive against Israel? And so even though con the very concept of having a leadership challenge in the Palestinian Authority 
could potentially mean an intifada or more violence uh, here in Israel. And then one of the um, sticky points between Israel and the US was the, uh, the approach of the Israeli administration towards China. How will this government handle China? Does it have any effect? And now that there's a new government in the US as of, uh, uh, as of earlier this year, it, are we expected the two uh, governments to cooperate on this issue? Well, I think that Yair yeah, Lapid especially is going to make it a priority of trying to improve the diplomatic relations between Israel and the uh, Democratic administration, Senate and Congress in the United States. And so I think you're going to see that they will just take whatever line the United States tells them to take with regard to China. If they say, you know, don't do this or don't do that, Israel's not going to do it. Um, you know, I think that Netanyahu uh, correctly identified during the Obama administration that the United States, you know, may or may not be a reliable ally depending on who's in office. And so he really hedge his bet, like he hedged those bets. He said, we can't, Israel's, uh, Israel's diplomacy can't just be in the basket of the United States. We need to diversify our portfolio. And that's why he went out of his way to improve the relationships with Russia, with China, with Japan, with other countries. And in a way that that sort of holds the US policy a little bit uh, in check. Um, but I, I think that uh, I wouldn't expect a foreign minister and alternate prime minister Lapid and new prime minister Bennett to, to challenge the United States on that. Thank you. And uh, regarding the Ram party, um, wasn't Netanyahu also willing to bring the Ram party into his coalition? What's the difference between Bennett and uh, Bibi's approach to the Ram party? That's absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of things that Netanyahu did or was willing to do in order to stay in power uh, that, basically gave the kosher stamp of approval to other governments to do the same thing. And then in the third election period, um, the left could have formed the government 61 seats together with the joint Arab list. And at the time, it seemed like a red line that Benny Gantz didn't want to cross uh, to have a, a left wing government relying on the Arab parties because it would have been the first time that happened. And he thought that that was himself being more of a Gantz being more of a centrist. He thought that that was too far a move to make and it would be dangerous to rely on the Arab parties. Now, Netanyahu felt that if he had a right wing government and if it was backed by Ram, first of all, that he could just use economic incentives to uh, keep Mansour Abbas very happy and in the government. But he also believed that if he formed the government and if the those members of the right that wanted to go into the opposition saw that Netanyahu won the election and formed the government and that it was stable, that they ultimately would have come in uh, to that to that alignment. And then you would have a government that didn't necessarily have to rely on Ram. And even if Ram was in the government, there's a difference between inviting an Arab party into the government for the first time as part of like a, an integration move, uh, which is different than if Rom's seats hold the government up. Okay, that's like a totally different position in terms of the parliamentary coalition. Uh, Netanyahu thought that he could keep Rom in check if he brought them in. And, and he also thought like if he was the prime minister, he would manage that. But like I said, he, he made that kosher. And uh, it doesn't mean that uh, Bennett and Lapid will manage it the same way. And also, again, because this is the Middle East and... Arab parties, you know, Arab actors in the region test the strength of the of the Jewish state at all levels. They will test the metal of this uh, of this government. Thank you. And you mentioned in a, in a previous webinar uh, the possibility of changing uh, some laws in Israel and how uh, elections are conducted because it created this whole system of four four elections in a row. Given the fact that now there's an Israeli prime minister who has more bodyguards around him than seats in the Knesset, and you have a political party of the Likud, which is almost uh, double the size as each one of the parties coming right after them, uh, is that are those talks still on the table, or has that been archived for now? 
about changing the government. So yeah, the system of governance is uh, here, it's, it's tenuous, but it would take a very, very strong government to be able to change the political system in Israel. And yet at the same time, if you had a, a party or a leader that was able to form a very strong government within the system, he might not have an incentive to change it. Uh, I do think that this government will try to enact term limits uh, for a prime minister um, because they all ran on that. Uh, I think they should also consider term limits for all members of parliament, but I have a feeling they're not going to do that. Uh, there's also talks that they could raise the electoral threshold from about three and a quarter percent, uh, maybe up to 5% or even up to 10% to prevent smaller parties from both joining the government, but also holding the government hostage, which is what you have. And now you have a, a tiny party, uh, the Yamina party with its leader as the prime minister. And that's not a good situation for a parliamentary dem democracy to have such a, a head of a small party be the prime minister. So you kind of want to get to a situation which you don't have small parties and raising the threshold. What it does is it incentivizes the small parties to, to join together as a larger block. And it's also very easy for uh, parties to disintegrate even once they get across the threshold and to make rebel factions and things like that. So you definitely want to sort of stabilize the system to say, hey, you can't get into the government unless you really have a large electoral backing to begin with. And once you're in, you can't just break up so easily as to be able to cause chaos. Um, Netanyahu, of course, wants legislation for a uh, direct election for prime minister. Um, in the past, that's actually been a failure because what happens is if you can go to the, the voting booth and you can choose your prime minister on the one hand, and then you can sort of choose your your ideological uh, leaning for the, for a party for the parliamentarians, what will happen is that the fringe parties wind up getting more seats at the expense of the large parties, because you say, okay, well, you know, a lot of people that now vote for Likud specifically because they want Netanyahu to be the prime minister will say, well, I'm going to vote for Netanyahu to be the prime minister, but I'm going to vote for the far right wing party because I want Netanyahu to have right wing policies. So I need to strengthen the right wing. Said so Netanyahu does the right wing policy. So, um, you know, that's a big challenge. It, it makes for unstable governance. Uh, if you have a direct election for prime minister, of course, for Netanyahu, that might be his only path back to the prime ministership. So that's what he wants. Um, I don't know if we'll get a change in the governance anytime soon. Um, we'll see if Israel will get a constitution anytime soon. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, as always, we can listen to you forever and ever. Um, the hour went by so quickly. And first of all, I have to apologize if there were some questions that we didn't get to, um, because this is you know, such an incredibly intricate um, um, issue. And um, it's very, very hard to exhaust every single aspect of it and, and the detail that many of us are demanding. And that is why we have you back so often, because Alex, um, to be honest, there are very few people who have the kind of knowledge of the workings of the Israeli government that you do. And we're, we're just honored and delighted to have you. Um, I should say that, um, you know, all of this does um, cost a great deal of money for Amet, and we have weekly webinars with um, who people whom we believe are the world's greatest experts on these issues. And um, we really believe um, to our core that a well-informed um, electorate does translate to well-informed policies when living in a democracy. Um, so um, if um, people would like to support us, we can definitely use your support. And just um, if you go to www.metonline.org, we appreciate any support that you could give in order to be able to continue our quality programming. Yeah, um, and if I can just add on that point, uh, really the work that you're doing uh, on the Congress and educating the congressmen and the staffers and the senators and their staffers, and really identifying what's dangerous legislation that needs to be canceled, what's good legislation that can really help Israel and the Jewish people. I think that you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes that that people don't really see. So you're you your guys are like undercover uh, superheroes in in Capitol Hill for the Jewish people, and I definitely definitely encourage people to support uh, Emmet as as ever they can. 
Thank you so much, Alex. We're, we're, we're really honored right now. Um, I should say that a legislation that we worked on, the Israel Normalization Act, which one of our um, staffers, Hussein Ab uh, Bakar Mansour, had a hand in drafting, is now being promoted by APAC. And we're delighted to hear that because that means it will probably pass. So, you know, it's um, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And we're, we're delighted to see this happening. Um, thank you so much, Alex, um, and um, stay tuned. I think next we are also working on um, trying to make sure none of our um, American taxpayers' dollars goes to UNRWA because of the um, tremendous collaboration that has been proven um, that UNRWA had um, with Hamas during this last war and because of the incitement to hate and to kill in their books. So stay tuned. I think our next webinar is going to be devoted to that. And um, again, thank you so much, Alex, for your thank wisdom. You, okay. Bye-bye now.